Chapter 4 A Shift in Our Heroine's Affections Catherine's reaction to her disappointing evening in the upper rooms was to go to bed and sleep for nine uninterrupted hours. She awoke the next morning perfectly rested, in excellent spirits and with fresh hopes and schemes. She wanted to get to know Miss Tilney better, and with that in mind, she planned to go in the early afternoon to the pump room, where any new arrival in Bath was likely to be. And so, our heroine happily sat with Mrs. Allen that morning, reading her book and smiling at her companion's comments about everything that crossed her mind, from a stain on the carpet to the noise of a carriage in the street. Then, at about half-past twelve, an extremely loud knock on the door made both ladies look up suddenly. Before the servant could announce him, Mr. John Thorpe came running up the stairs and into Mrs. Allen's sitting room. Well, Miss Morland, here we are. Isabella and your brother are waiting outside in their carriage and are in a great hurry to get going. Good morning, Mrs. Allen. Terribly good ball last night, wasn't it? Have you seen my fine carriage outside? Far superior to the rented carriage Morland is driving. Mr. Thorpe, what is happening? asked Catherine. Miss Morland, what a silly girl you are. You agreed to go for a drive this morning. We are all going up Claverton Hill. I remember that you mentioned a carriage ride, but really, I did not expect you, Catherine explained. Not expect me? I wonder how you would have complained if I had not come for you, shouted John Thorpe. Catherine did not know what to do, and so looked to Mrs. Allen for guidance. She wondered if it was proper to go for a drive in Mr. Thorpe's carriage without a chaperone. Would Mrs. Allen approve, since James and Isabella were going too? Well, madam, shall I go or not? asked Catherine. Do as you please, my dear replied Mrs. Allen calmly. She did not seem to understand any of Catherine's anxiety. A drive in an open carriage, with Isabella and James following behind in a second carriage, was almost as exciting as the possibility of another meeting with Miss Tilney. And, with Mrs. Allen's permission, Catherine was ready to go in two minutes. As she and Mr. Thorpe hurried out of the house, they were greeted by Isabella. Catherine, my dearest creature, what a delightful ball we had last night. I have a thousand things to discuss with you, but now I am anxious to begin our adventure. John Thorpe helped Catherine into his carriage, saying, Don't be frightened, Miss Morland, if my horse shows a bit of spirit. You are in no danger. I am an excellent horseman. With this warning, Catherine was surprised when the horse started and continued in the quietest manner imaginable. A silence of several minutes was broken when Mr. Thorpe suddenly asked, Old Allen is one of the richest men in Wiltshire, isn't he? Oh, do you mean Mr. Allen? asked Catherine, not understanding how this topic of conversation had come up. Yes, I believe he is very rich. And no children at all? No, not any. And he is a relative of yours, isn't he? Oh, no, we are not related. But you spend a lot of time with them? Yes, very much. After that short exchange... Mr. Thorpe talked about more topics that interested him. His horse, the value of his carriage, his skill as a horseman, the expensive wine he served in his Oxford apartment. Catherine had been brought up in a family of plain people who were not in the habit of telling lies or exaggerating their own importance. Mr. Thorpe, on the other hand, 
was obviously accustomed to a type of conversation which always began and ended with praise for himself. Catherine had little idea of how such young men ought to behave, but she could not rid herself of the conviction that Mr. Thorpe was not an agreeable person. It was a difficult and bold conclusion to come to, since he was her brother's friend and dear Isabella's brother. But in spite of this, when she was in John Thorpe's company, Catherine was quickly bored and felt exhausted by his lack of interest in anything but himself. After what seemed like hours to Catherine, the carriages finally returned to Mrs. Allen's door. Past three o'clock, cried Isabella. It is impossible. I cannot believe my watch. No two and a half hours have ever gone by so rapidly and so nicely. Don't you agree, dear Catherine? Our heroine could not tell a lie, even to please Isabella. But she was spared the need to disagree with her friend, because Isabella did not wait for her answer. I have a thousand things to talk to you about, but now I have to go home, complained Isabella. And with the gestures of a tragic actress, mixed with her satisfied smile and laughing eyes, Isabella called goodbye to Catherine and left her. Catherine found Mrs. Allen in her sitting room. Well, my dear, I hope your afternoon was as pleasant as mine, began Mrs. Allen. I went to the pump room as soon as you were gone and met Mrs. Thorpe there. Then we met Mrs. Hughes and Mr. Tilney and his sister in the Crescent. They are very agreeable people, and Miss Tilney was wearing a particularly pretty dress. Very expensive, I imagine. Of course, the family is very wealthy, according to Mrs. Hughes. Did you learn anything else about the Tilneys? Quite a lot. They are a very good, very rich family. The mother, Mrs. Tilney, was Miss Drummond before her marriage and was at school with Mrs. Hughes. She brought a large fortune to her marriage to General Tilney. And are General and Mrs. Tilney in Bath? asked Catherine, hungry for more information. Let me think, said Mrs. Allen. I believe Mrs. Tilney is dead, because Mrs. Hughes told me there was a beautiful set of pearls that Mr. Drummond gave his daughter on her wedding day, and that Miss Tilney has them now. They were given to her when her mother died. I think that is what Mrs. Hughes said. And is Mr. Tilney, my dance partner, the only son? I am not sure about that, my dear. I think he is. But anyway, he is a very fine young man, according to Mrs. Hughes, and he has a good future ahead of him. Catherine deeply regretted having missed such a meeting with both brother and sister, especially since it had been replaced by a rather unpleasant drive with a rather disagreeable companion. That evening, the Allens, Thorpes and Morlands met at the theatre, and finally Isabella had an opportunity to communicate with Catherine about the thousands of things she had been wishing to discuss with her dear friend. Now, Mr. Morland, Isabella began, turning to James Morland on her left, I shall not speak another word to you all the rest of the evening, so do not expect it. Then turning to Catherine on her right, she continued, My sweetest Catherine, how lovely you look! You are sure to attract every man in Bath. My brother is already in love with you, and Mr. Tilney must have returned to Bath just to see you. Look around and tell me if he is here. I assure you that I can hardly breathe until I have a look at him. I'm sorry, said Catherine. 
I cannot see him anywhere. How horrible. Am I never to make his acquaintance? Do you like my dress? I think it suits me. Don't you? Do you know that I am becoming quite sick of Bath? Your brother and I were discussing it this morning. It is enjoyable to be here for a few weeks, but we both prefer the country. I imagine that you have some clever comment to make about the ridiculous fact that James and I can find nothing to disagree about. No, it does not sound ridiculous to me. Oh, you would probably like to say that we seem made for each other or some such nonsense of that kind. No, you misjudge me, Isabella. I would never make such an improper remark, protested Catherine. Isabella smiled and gave Catherine a look which seemed very significant. Then she turned to her left and talked to James for the rest of the evening. The next afternoon, Catherine had a similar experience in the pump room when she joined her brother James and Isabella Thorpe for a walk around the room. Catherine soon realised that she had no part in either her friend's or her brother's conversation. The two of them constantly laughed and teased each other, or playfully argued about some insignificant topic. They often asked for Catherine's opinion, but they never seemed to hear anything she tried to add to the discussion. Thankfully, Catherine was rescued from this situation when she saw Mrs. Hughes and Miss Tilney enter the pump room. Miss Tilney greeted her very warmly, and she and Catherine enjoyed a pleasant conversation marked by a simple, honest style on both sides. Your brother dances very well, Catherine said innocently, and he is so interesting to talk to. This surprisingly direct statement amused Miss Tilney. Henry, she replied with a smile. Yes, we have often said that he dances very well. And he loves conversation. He must have thought it very odd the other evening when he invited me to dance and I refused. But I really had been engaged the whole day to dance with Mr Thorpe. Miss Tilney smiled and remained silent. I was so surprised to see Mr Tilney. I thought he might have left Bath for good. No. When you first met him, Henry was here for a few days to find lodgings for us, Miss Tilney explained. Oh, I see now. I think the young lady he danced with on Monday was very glad to have such a good partner. Did you think she was very pretty? asked Catherine. Not very, answered Miss Tilney, who was enjoying her companion's questions. I suppose your brother never comes to the pump room. He does sometimes, but this morning he has gone riding with our father. When the two ladies parted, Catherine was not conscious of having revealed anything about herself, but Miss Tilney was certain that she had discovered something important about her new acquaintance's feelings. There was a ball the next evening, and Catherine dressed carefully, hoping that she would meet Miss Tilney and her brother there. But before the Tilneys arrived, Catherine had to work hard at avoiding the attentions of Mr. John Thorpe. She hid herself from his view as much as possible, and when he spoke to her, she pretended not to hear him. When the dancing began, Isabella whispered, Don't be shocked, my dear Catherine, but I am going to dance with your brother again. I hope you and John will join us when he returns. Catherine started to say something to her friend, but Isabella hurried to the dance floor. Catherine could see John Thorpe approaching, and she worried that all was lost. She might have to dance with him again. But what luck! 
Mr. Tilney appeared and immediately asked her to dance. Not only had she had a lucky escape from John Thorpe, but it seemed that Mr. Tilney had sought her out on purpose. They joined a set and took their positions for the dance. However, Catherine's happiness was disturbed by the arrival of John Thorpe behind her. Hello, Miss Morland, Mr. Thorpe shouted. I thought we would be dancing together this evening. Mr. Thorpe, you did not ask me to dance, replied Catherine. That is a good joke. I asked you as soon as I came into the room. This is a low trick to play on a fellow. I told my friends that I was going to dance with the prettiest girl in the room, and now you have abandoned me. And who is this partner of yours? He is Mr. Henry Tilney, answered Catherine quietly. I do not know him. A good-looking man. Does he need a horse? I can get a good one for him from Sam Fletcher. He sold me my last horse, a really good hunter. The dance was beginning now, and Mr. Thorpe was forced to leave the floor. When Mr. Tilney came close to Catherine, he said, I was getting very impatient with that gentleman, taking your attention from me. We have agreed to be faithful to each other as dance partners for the evening, and a man who tries to claim the attention of another man's partner is breaking what I consider an important contract. Neither person should look around and wonder about the advantages of having a different partner. Don't you agree? Yes, of course I agree, answered Catherine enthusiastically. May I come to the conclusion, then, that if the gentleman who spoke to you just now were to return, or if any other gentleman wanted to talk to you, you would excuse yourself? And concentrate your attention on me, your partner. Well, it would be honest to say that I do not want to talk to any other gentleman this evening, Catherine said prettily. I am very satisfied with that guarantee, and I shall continue with courage. Do you find Bath as agreeable as when I had the honour of asking that question before? Yes, quite. Even more so than before. More so? Be careful. The fashionable young ladies always get tired of Bath at the end of six weeks. Well... Other people must judge for themselves, but I do not think I would be tired of Bath at the end of six months, insisted Catherine. I do not think I could ever be tired of Bath. As the dance progressed, Catherine noticed a handsome older man with a rather noble attitude standing in the crowd and staring at her. Then she saw him whisper something to Henry Tilney, and both men looked at her again before the older man withdrew from the dance floor. Henry politely approached Catherine and said, That gentleman is General Tilney, my father, and he was asking me who you are. Later that evening, Catherine had a very welcome opportunity for a chat with Henry Tilney and his sister. They discovered that all three of them had a special liking for country walks. Shall we have a walk together one morning? suggested Miss Tilney. I would like that better than anything in the world, Catherine said enthusiastically. Shall we go tomorrow? The three young people agreed, unless there was rain, to go out for a walk together at twelve o'clock the next day. And so, although she had seen hardly anything of her good friend Isabella during the entire evening, Catherine travelled home in the carriage with Mr. and Mrs. Allen in such good spirits that she danced in her seat all the way. At breakfast the next morning, Catherine looked out at a disappointing sky full of clouds. Then at eleven o'clock, 
when she was watching the weather with great attention, a few drops of rain hit the sitting-room window. Oh, Mrs. Allen, do you think the rain will stop before midday? Perhaps it may, my dear, answered Mrs. Allen, but then the streets will be very dirty and muddy. I do not mind dirt and mud. I would still be happy to go for a walk. But, oh, dear, now I see four raised umbrellas. But I will not give up until half-past twelve, Catherine said. That is just the time of day for the weather to change. Oh, why can't we have the kind of beautiful weather they had in Udolpho? Then, just as the clock struck the half hour, the sky really did begin to clear and the rain stopped. In ten more minutes, the sun was shining and it promised to be a fine, bright afternoon. Catherine continued to sit at the window hoping that the Tilneys would appear for their country walk. But instead of the Tilneys, she was surprised by the arrival of Isabella and John Thorpe, and her own brother James. "'Be hasty, Miss Morland!' shouted Mr Thorpe, as he entered Mrs Allen's sitting-room. "'The carriages are waiting, and we're all going to Clifton to dine, and then on to Blaise Castle.' Thank you, but I cannot go. I am waiting for my friends, Mr. and Miss Tilney. I am engaged to go for a walk in the country with them. They promised to come at twelve, but it rained. Now, with this fine weather, I expect them here soon. No, they will not be coming, insisted Mr. Thorpe. I saw them in a carriage and heard them say that they were going as far as Wix Rocks. Anyway, it is much too dirty for a country walk. Oh, that is disappointing, said Catherine. But what about this castle? Is it really old? Is it like the castle in Udolpho? It is almost exactly the same, said Mr Thorpe. Then... Shall I go, Mrs. Allen? What do you think? Catherine asked. Well, my dear, I suppose you should go, said Mrs. Allen. And in two minutes, the four young people had begun their journey. Catherine felt upset that she had not heard anything from the Tilneys, but she had to admit that she was excited about seeing a real castle. The carriages went down Pulteney Street and through Laura Place and John Thorpe once again talked about his horse and his skills as a driver. Then, near Argyle Street, Mr Thorpe said, Who is that girl on the pavement who is staring at you as we passed her? Catherine looked back and saw Miss Tilney walking along the pavement, holding her brother's arm, and both of them were looking directly at her. Stop, stop, Mr Thorpe! Catherine cried impatiently. It is Miss Tilney and her brother. How could you tell me that they had gone out of town? Stop, stop! I must speak to them. But John Thorpe did not stop. In fact, he laughed and encouraged his horse to go faster. And in another minute, the Tilneys were out of sight. Now the carriage was moving so quickly that Catherine could not possibly escape from it, and she felt extremely angry. Why did you lie to me, Mr. Thorpe? And why didn't you stop when I asked you to? They must think that I am very rude. Their drive, even after they had stopped talking about the Tilneys, was not very agreeable. Catherine obviously would have preferred a country walk with the Tilneys, but at least she had a real castle to look forward to. When they could see the town of Canesham, James Morland shouted at Mr. Thorpe, and the two carriages came to a stop. We had better go back, Thorpe, James began. Isabella agrees. We left too late to visit Blaise Castle today. It does not matter to me, said Mr. Thorpe, turning his carriage around for the drive back to Bath. 
As they started again, he said to Catherine, Your brother is a fool not to have his own horse and carriage. If he had a good horse like mine, we could easily have reached the castle today. But he could not afford to keep a horse and carriage, objected Catherine. And why can't he afford it? He does not have money for those things, replied Catherine. Well, I think it is a bad practice for people who are rolling in money to be too mean to have a good horse and carriage. Catherine did not understand what Mr. Thorpe was talking about, and she had become less and less willing to listen to anything he had to say. They returned to Pulteney Street without her speaking twenty words. When she entered Mr. and Mrs. Allen's house, a servant told Catherine that a young lady and gentleman had called for her a few minutes after she had set off with Mr. Thorpe. Thinking about this upsetting news, our heroine walked slowly upstairs to her room, but was stopped by Mr. Allen. Dear Catherine, I am glad your brother was sensible enough to bring you home in good time. It was a strange, wild scheme. That night, our heroine went to bed feeling confused and unhappy, unable to sleep, because she was busy reliving the terrible events of the day. Chapter 5 Seeds of Misunderstanding Mrs. Allen, said Catherine the next morning, Will there be any harm in my visiting Miss Tilney today? I will not be calm until I have explained everything that happened yesterday. With Mrs. Allen's permission and advice on which dress to wear, our heroine anxiously hurried to the Tilney's lodgings in Milsom Street. The door was opened by a servant who said he would check if Miss Tilney was at home. When he returned to Catherine, the servant said, Miss Tilney has gone out. Something made Catherine think that Miss Tilney was in the house, but was too offended to see her. When she got to the bottom of the street, she looked back and saw Miss Tilney and General Tilney himself coming out of the house. Catherine's first reaction was to feel angry but then she remembered how her own actions might have been misinterpreted and was determined not to judge Miss Tilney unfairly. Catherine was in a rather thoughtful mood all day, but was persuaded to go to the theatre that night with the Allens and the Thorpes. The comedy, one that she had been looking forward to seeing, almost immediately lifted her mood. But at the beginning of the fifth act, Catherine saw Mr. Henry Tilney and his father join a group of people in the opposite box, and all her anxiety and distress returned. She lost interest in the play and watched Mr. Tilney. Finally, he looked towards her and bowed, but what a cold bow it was. He did not smile and immediately turned his eyes back towards the stage. Catherine's heart raced, and she felt miserable and eager for an opportunity to explain herself to him. The play came to its conclusion. The curtain fell, and Catherine's wish came true. Henry Tilney came round to the Allens' box. He greeted the Allens very politely, but Catherine did not wait for him to speak to her. Oh, Mr. Tilney! I have been quite wild to speak to you, to make my apologies. You must have thought me so rude yesterday. But really, it was not my fault, was it, Mrs. Allen? Mr. John Thorpe told me that you and your sister had gone out in your carriage. What could I do? But I would have ten thousand times preferred to be with you, wouldn't I, Mrs. Allen? Yes, my dear, but calm down. You will damage my dress said Mrs. Allen. I begged Mr. Thorpe to stop his carriage and let me out when I saw you, Catherine rushed on, but he would not even slow down. 
If he had, I would have jumped out of the carriage and run after you. No man could choose not to accept Catherine's sincere apology and explanation, and Henry Tinley smiled politely and told her that she must say no more about it. My sister would also like to apologise to you, Miss Morland, for her own behaviour this morning, Mr Tilney added. That is not necessary. It is understandable that she did not want to see me after yesterday's disaster. But Eleanor did not choose to ignore you. My father wanted her to accompany him on his walk. He is not a patient man, and told the servant to send you away, so I would like to apologise for her. And now, may I join you for a few minutes? What did you think of tonight's play? Catherine chatted with Mr Tilney for some time, and they made plans to take their country walk as soon as possible, which made Catherine believe that she was one of the happiest creatures in all the world. But a new mystery appeared while the two young people were together. Catherine observed with some surprise that John Thorpe was in the opposite box, talking to General Tilney and looking over at her from time to time. Does Mr Thorpe know your father well? Catherine asked. I did not know that they were acquaintances, but my father is a military man and has a wide circle of friends. On Sunday afternoon in the Crescent, Catherine met Henry and Eleanor Tilney by chance, and they decided to go for their country walk the next morning. At almost the same time, the Thorpes and James Morland were looking for Catherine to tell her about their plans for another carriage ride into the country, also on Monday morning. My dear, Isabella began when they found Catherine. We are going on our trip to Clifton tomorrow morning. You must be ready early so that we have time to see and do everything. I'm very sorry, but I cannot go with you tomorrow. I'm engaged to go for a walk with Eleanor Tilney and her brother. But we cannot go without you, complained Isabella. Explain that you had forgotten you were engaged to go with us. Don't try to persuade me, Isabella. I will not break my engagement with the Tilneys. But the discussion did not end there. My dearest, sweetest Catherine, you cannot refuse such a small request from me, a friend who loves you so dearly, Isabella tried. You cannot possibly love Miss Tilney more than you love me. You can go for your country walk another day. But Catherine would not change her plans. Well, I cannot help feeling jealous when I see that you prefer strangers over me, answered Isabella as she wiped away a tear from her cheek. It seemed to Catherine that Isabella was actually behaving quite selfishly and not considering her feelings at all. I am sorry, but I will not change my plans, Catherine insisted. Very well, then. That is the end of our party tomorrow. If Catherine does not go, I cannot, said Isabella through her tears. It would be very improper. Why can't Mr Thorpe invite one of his younger sisters? I imagine they would like to go for a carriage ride, suggested Catherine. Mr Thorpe, who had left the group for a few minutes, heard this suggestion and shouted, Thank you very much, but I did not come to Bath to drive those silly girls around. And anyway, I have solved the problem, and now we may all forego tomorrow with no worries. I have spoken to Miss Tilney and made your excuses. You can go out with them another day. No! 
I cannot believe you would do such a thing, cried Catherine. I have done it. I told her you had sent me to say that having just remembered a prior engagement of going to Clifton with us tomorrow, you could not walk with her until Tuesday. She said Tuesday was convenient for her, so there is an end to our argument. That was a good idea of mine, wasn't it? No, it was not. I must run after Miss Tilney and explain everything. You had no business inventing a message from me and trying to trick me into doing what I thought was wrong. As Catherine rushed off to find Miss Tilney, her mind was greatly troubled. She did not like disappointing and displeasing her brother and Isabella, but she would not break a promise that had already been made, and she would not fail to keep an engagement with Miss Tilney and her brother for the second time. She saw the Tilneys and their father as they entered their lodgings and hurried after them. Miss Tilney! Catherine shouted. I told them that I could not go with them. I ran here to explain everything to you. Although Catherine's speech was not completely clear, the Tilneys understood her and everyone was on friendly terms again. Eleanor introduced Catherine to General Tilney, who welcomed her into their house very politely and invited her to join them for dinner one evening if the Allens could spare her. After sitting with the three of them for a quarter of an hour, General Tilney accompanied Catherine to the street and said goodbye in the most graceful, friendly manner. At Pulteney Street, Catherine wondered if she had been unkind to Isabella and James and mentioned their plan to Mr. Allen. Were you thinking of going with them? asked Mr. Allen. No, sir. I had just agreed to go for a walk with Miss Tilney, so I could not go with them, could I? No, certainly not. And I'm glad you would not consider it. I do not approve of young men and women who are not related, driving around the country in open carriages, going to inns and public places together. It is not proper, and I am surprised that Mrs. Thorpe allows it. I wish Mrs. Allen had stopped me on the other occasion, said Catherine quietly. No harm has been done. Mr. Allen replied, but I would advise you, my dear, not to go out with Mr. Thorpe any more. Monday dawned clear and bright, and Catherine was rewarded with a perfect walk in the country with the pleasantest companions, Eleanor and Henry Tilney. The conversation covered every imaginable topic, ranging from the novels of Mrs. Radcliffe, which all three were fans of, to an analysis of the current government. Catherine listened with great attention after the talk moved away from the Gothic novels that she loved so much. She was very impressed with how much both Eleanor and Henry knew about history, art, nature, and even politics. You may remember that she had never been a very willing student, and this fact actually made her very good company for such clever conversationalists as the Tilneys. Obvious admiration for a young man's superior knowledge is always a great advantage in an attractive young woman. The whole walk was delightful, and although it ended too soon for Catherine, she was very pleased by its conclusion. When they returned to Pulteney Street, Miss Tilney asked Mrs. Allen if they might invite Catherine to join them for dinner on the day after next. No difficulty was made on Mrs. Allen's side, and Catherine's only problem was to hide her excessive pleasure at receiving this kind invitation. The morning had been so charming, so enjoyable, 
that Catherine had not thought about James or Isabella, but was reminded of them in the afternoon when she happened to meet Miss Anne Thorpe in Bond Street. Good afternoon, Anne, Catherine began. Did your sister and brother go for their drive to Clifton this morning? Yes, my other sister Maria went with them. I think you had a lucky escape. It must have been a very boring, dull drive. But Maria was excited about going. I decided immediately that I did not want to go with them. Catherine doubted that Anne wanted to be left behind, but she was happy to know that the trip had not been cancelled because of her refusal to join it. Before leaving, she asked, Aunt, did Maria enjoy seeing Blaise Castle? Oh, they did not see any castles. They had lunch at the York Hotel in Clifton, and after a walk they had tea there too, before returning to Bath. The next morning, Catherine hurried to the Thorpe's lodgings, wanting to be certain that she was on good terms with Isabella again. But Isabella seemed to have forgotten that there had been any disagreement between them as she rushed into the sitting room to greet her dear friend. Darling Catherine, from the beginning, you understood more about me than I understood about myself. You have seen through everything. Catherine could not reply, because she did not understand what Isabella was talking about. My sweetest, my most precious friend, continued the older girl. You can see that I am amazingly excited. Let us sit down and talk about what you have already guessed, you clever creature. Your brother is the most charming man on earth. I only wish that I deserved him. But what do you think your excellent father and mother will say when he speaks to them? Oh, I am so worried that they will not accept me for their dear son. Finally, Catherine began to understand what Isabella was talking about. Isabella, are you telling me that you and James are in love? and soon Catherine had heard the whole story. The young couple had spoken of their love for each other during yesterday's carriage ride. Now Catherine was thrilled to think that her dear friend Isabella would one day be her sister-in-law. Catherine, you will mean so much more to me than either Anne or Maria. I feel that I will be much more attached to the Moorland family than to my own, Isabella insisted. This idea astonished Catherine, and she honestly thought it was inappropriate. But she was delighted to hear Isabella's story of how the engagement had happened. I remember the first time I met your dear brother, continued Isabella. With me, the first moment... Settles everything. When he visited us in London, I lost my heart to him immediately. I remember I was wearing my yellow silk dress, and when I came into the sitting room, I thought I had never seen anybody so handsome as dear James. Here, Catherine secretly thought about the power of love, because although she was very fond of her brother, she had never once thought that he was handsome. Catherine, your brother caused me many sleepless nights. I was sure he would fall in love with someone else. He is such a wonderful man. I knew you understood what was in my heart, especially when I told you that I had a particular liking for clergymen. I was sure that my secret would be safe with you. Once again, Catherine was surprised by what Isabella thought she knew. But she saw no reason to change her friend's mind about the situation. She learned that her brother was already on his way to Fullerton to ask for his parents' permission to become engaged to Miss Isabella Thorpe. 
Will they accept me, dear Catherine? My fortune is very small, and your brother could marry anyone he chose. Again, Catherine thought about the strength of love, and said, Isabella, you're too humble. The difference between your fortunes will not affect anything. Catherine, not everyone would have such a generous heart as yours. I just wish that the situations were reversed. If I had command of millions and ruled the world, your brother would be my only choice. I need very little in life, and where people are attached by love, poverty itself is not a problem. Catherine liked this idea. It sounded like something from one of her novels. I will not think of a wedding or a house or anything of that sort until we have your father's answer, continued Isabella. Your dear brother said that he will send me news tomorrow, but I know I will not have courage enough to open his letter. The two friends spent every moment together that day and the next, talking of nothing except how happy they would be as sisters. Finally, after much anxiety, the post was delivered on the second day, and Isabella opened her letter from Fullerton. James wrote, I have gained the approval of my kind parents, and they promise that everything in their power will be done to guarantee my happiness. The brightest look spread across Isabella's face and she said that she was the happiest woman on earth. The entire Thorpe family were now very happy and wanted to hear about the details of Mr. Morland's promise. What would his income be? Would he be given property by his family? What kind of ring would Isabella receive? What would their carriage and their house be like? Where would they live? Mr. John Thorpe had business in London, and now that Isabella had her letter, he prepared to depart. Well, Miss Morland, he said, finding Catherine alone in the sitting room. I have come to say goodbye for the present time. Goodbye, sir. I hope you have a safe journey. What do you think of this marrying idea, Miss Morland? I am sure marriage is a very good thing, replied Catherine. Do you? I am glad you are not an enemy to marriage. By the way, do you know that old song that says, One wedding brings another? Perhaps we may find out if that old song has some truth in it at Isabella's wedding. May we? asked Catherine feeling quite confused. But I never sing, so I would not know. Well, I wish you a good journey. I dine with Miss Tilney today, so I must rush home. Don't hurry away. I will be gone from Bath for a fortnight, and it will seem a long time. When will we be together again? Well... We will see you when you return. Goodbye for now, said Catherine, trying to get away. That is very kind of you, Miss Morland. You are probably the nicest person I know. You have so many good qualities. Sir, there are much nicer, better people than me. Good morning to you. I must get home. But, Miss Morland, may I visit Fullerton one day soon? My father and mother would be pleased to meet you. And I hope, Miss Morland, that you would be pleased to see me there. It is always nice to have company at our house. I agree with you. Give me some cheerful company and I am very happy. I believe you and I agree about most things. That idea has never occurred to me, said Catherine, 
In fact, I do not know my own mind about most things. I am the same, cried Mr. Thorpe. I have a simple idea about most things. Let me have a girl I like and a comfortable house and I would be satisfied. Fortune is nothing. I am sure of a good income of my own, so my wife does not need to have a penny. I am in agreement with you there, sir. If there is a good fortune on one side, there can be no need for any on the other. I hate the idea of one great fortune marrying another, and I think it is very wicked of people to marry for money. Goodbye. We shall be glad to see you in Fullerton one day. And having said that, Catherine hurried out of the Thorpe's house without another thought about John Thorpe. She was concentrating on getting ready for her dinner with Miss Tilney. Mr. Thorpe felt very satisfied. He believed that Miss Morland had clearly encouraged his attentions, and he intended to pursue her confidently and without hesitation. Chapter 6 A Friend's True Nature Revealed Catherine went to the Tilney's lodgings with high hopes of a particularly pleasurable evening. And of course, this could only lead to disappointment. Although General Tilney was extremely polite to her, Eleanor Tilney welcomed her warmly, and Henry Tilney was as charming as usual. The happiness that Catherine had expected was not achieved. Somehow the evening did not have the spirit, or perhaps the magic, that Catherine had wished for. On leaving the party, Catherine's conclusion was that nobody was to blame, and that the evening was just one of those unfortunate failures that happen occasionally. But when she described the evening to Isabella, her reaction was very different. I blame it on pride. Rude, unbearable pride. The people in that family think they are very grand. I have never heard of such unfriendly behaviour as Miss Tilney's. Hardly even to speak to you, a guest. But Isabella... You are misinterpreting my words. Miss Tilney was not rude. She was very polite, very proper and correct. Please don't defend her or her brother. He had appeared so attached to you, and then he hardly looked at you when you were a guest in their house. How rude. No, Isabella, that is not what I said. I simply meant... That he did not seem in good spirits. I hate this type of inconstant behaviour in anyone. Never think of him again. He does not deserve your attention. I do not suppose that he ever thinks of me, said Catherine. Do you see how different he is from your brother and from mine? I really believe that John has the most faithful heart. But General Tilney, I assure you, could not have treated me with more attention or with greater politeness. It seemed that his only care was to make me happy. Oh, I do not suspect him of pride. John thinks very highly of him, and I trust my brother's judgment. Well, we will meet again this evening at the rooms. So I will wait until then to judge their behaviour towards me. And must I go? asked Isabella. Of course, I can refuse you nothing, but you know that my heart is elsewhere. And you know that it is completely out of the question for me to think of dancing, so please do not suggest it although I know that Charles Hodges will beg me to dance with him. Isabella's opinion of the Tilneys did not influence Catherine's view of them. She was certain that they had not meant to be quiet or proud when she dined with them, 
and that evening she was proved right. Both Miss Tilney and her brother were clearly happy to see her, and treated her very kindly throughout the evening. And once again, she enjoyed her usual happiness as Henry's dance partner. At the end of the first dance, a tall, handsome young man approached Eleanor and Henry Tilney, and Catherine learned that this was their older brother, Captain Tilney. After a short, polite conversation, the older brother asked if they knew the pretty young woman sitting with some of the older ladies. Catherine explained that it was her good friend, Isabella Thorpe. Could you please introduce me to her? asked Captain Tilney. I would like to invite her to dance. I'm afraid that she would not dance this evening for any reason in the world, although I think it is very kind of you to think she might wish for a partner, said Catherine. When Catherine and Henry were returning to the dance floor, Henry said, Thank you for thinking that my brother was being kind in wanting to dance with Miss Thorpe. You allow the rest of the world to have motives that are as good and generous as your own. Catherine was lost in thought about Henry's comment when she heard Isabella's voice. She looked up and saw her with Captain Tilney, standing in the set opposite her and Henry. Isabella raised her eyebrows for a second and then smiled. How could this happen? Catherine said to Henry. Isabella was so determined not to dance. And has Isabella never changed her mind before? But what about your brother? Why did he invite her to dance after what I said? Asked Catherine, feeling very confused. And my brother makes his own decisions. But his behaviour does not surprise me. She is very pretty. And that would have been enough reason for him to have asked her. Catherine had no opportunity to speak to Isabella until the dance had finished and they were walking round the room arm in arm. Dear Catherine, I know you are surprised that I danced, and now I am exhausted, but he is very amusing, I must admit, although I would have preferred to sit still all evening. Why didn't you? asked Catherine, thinking of her brother. That would have made me look quite spoiled. And you know how I hate that kind of behaviour. I refused him as long as possible, but he would not give up. He said that he would dance with me, or with no one. Such nonsense! Since there would be no peace until I danced with him, and knowing that your dear brother would not want me to sit throughout the evening, I had to accept his invitation. He is such a smart-looking young fellow. Did you see that every eye was upon us? He is a very handsome man, Catherine agreed quietly. Oh, yes, I suppose he is very good-looking, but too proud. I scolded him about that several times in my way. Catherine was with Isabella in the sitting-room of the Thorpe's lodgings when her brother James's second letter arrived from Fullerton. It contained a summary of his father's kind arrangements for James and his wife's future happiness. As a clergyman, he would be given his father's living with the salary that went with it, and he would receive a future inheritance of equal value, then doubling his yearly salary. James wrote how grateful he was to his parents and explained the necessity of waiting between two and three years before he would have his parish and he and Isabella could marry, which is what he had expected. Catherine followed her brother's lead, and, feeling very satisfied with her parents' generosity and good wishes for the young couple, congratulated Isabella on having everything so pleasantly settled. It is very charming, I am sure said Isabella softly. 
Mr. Morland has behaved generously without doubt, added Mrs. Thorpe, looking anxiously at her daughter. I am sure that he would do more if he could. I am certain that if his fortunes change, he will do more for you and his son in the future. A clergyman's salary is a small amount to begin on. But you are very modest in your needs, dear Isabella. Well, as you know, I never think of myself, Isabella began. But I do not want to injure my dear James. Such a small income is hardly enough to pay for the essential requirements of life. For myself, that is unimportant. I never think of myself. Anyway, Mr. Morland has a right to do what he likes with his own money. Catherine felt hurt by what Isabella was implying, and said, I am sure that my father has promised as much as he can afford. Isabella quickly tried to cover up her true feelings. My dear Catherine, you know me well enough to know that I hate money, and would be happy with very little, but two or three years is a long time to wait until your brother and I can marry. The Allens now began the sixth of their eight weeks in Bath, and Catherine was looking forward to more opportunities to spend time with both Eleanor and Henry Tilney. But on her next visit to Miss Tilney at Milsom Street, she was disappointed to learn that the family would be leaving Bath at the end of the following week. I am afraid my father has missed some of his friends who did not come to Bath this year, explained Miss Tilney. Catherine was very upset by this news and wanted to ask Miss Tilney to promise to write. But before she could make her request, General Tilney entered the room. Well, Miss Morland, he said to Catherine, have you agreed? We leave Bath a week from Saturday, and if you will accompany us to Northanger Abbey... None of us will have any reason to miss this place. We cannot offer you all of the excitement of a place like Bath, but we will do everything we can to make your stay agreeable. Northanger Abbey. These were thrilling words to Catherine, and it was such a flattering invitation. To have her company so warmly requested. She thought her heart might burst if she tried to speak. A visit to Northanger Abbey held so much promise. A continued friendship with Eleanor, whom she greatly admired, and the possibility of a romance. But that was something she dared not mention to anyone. And, in addition to all that, she would be staying in an ancient abbey and would be able to explore every damp cellar, every hidden room, every ruined passage. The decayed walls would speak to her and tell her the stories hidden there. With a mind so full of excitement about her stay at Northanger Abbey, Catherine was hardly aware that two or three days passed without her seeing Isabella for more than a few minutes at a time. But one afternoon, Isabella sought her out in the pump room and asked her to sit with her on her favourite bench between two doors, where they could see everybody who entered the room before they were seen. As the two friends chatted, Catherine noticed that Isabella's eyes continually turned towards the entrance as if she were waiting for someone. Catherine decided to tease her friend a little and said, Don't worry, Isabella. James will be here soon. Catherine, my dear creature, do not think that I always want to keep James at my elbow. It would be awful to always be together. And so, you are going to Northanger Abbey. I am very glad for you. 
I understand that it is one of the finest old places in England. And you must write and tell me all about it. I will do my best. But who are you looking for? Are you expecting your sisters? I am not looking for anybody. My eyes must be somewhere. And you know my eyes wander when my thoughts are a hundred miles away. Tilney says... It is always the case with certain types of minds. But forget about that. I have something important to tell you. I have just had a letter from John, and I am sure you can guess what he has written about. No, I cannot. Why could I? asked Catherine innocently. Catherine, don't be naive. You know that he is head over heels in love with you. With me? Dear Isabella, why would you say such a thing? My sweet Catherine, be honest, and don't pretend you are not aware of his feelings. John says in his letter that just before he left Bath, he made it clear that he intended to propose marriage to you very soon, and that you encouraged him quite openly. Isabella, I am completely astonished by what you say. I had no idea that your brother was in love with me, and I certainly did not encourage him in any way. I sincerely swear that no talk of his proposing marriage to me ever passed between us. He must have misunderstood me in some way, because I never thought nor wished for anything of this kind from him. Please explain to him as properly as possible that I did not intend to deceive him in any way. But if I could think of one man more than any other, he is not that person. Please don't be angry with me, Isabella, because we shall, of course, still be sisters-in-law. Yes, yes, Isabella said, blushing. But there are more ways than one of our becoming sisters. But what am I talking about? My mind is wandering again. So you are determined not to accept a proposal from John. I cannot return his love, and I certainly never meant to encourage him, insisted Catherine. I must say, Catherine, that I agree with you. What would you and he live on? He has very little money. And it is no good saying that people can live on love, because it is just not possible. I think John cannot have received my last letter. And so you do understand what I have said. I did not mean to encourage your brother. Of course I understand, said Isabella. A little harmless flirtation often leads one person to assume they know another's mind. I assure you that I am the last person in the world to judge you severely in such matters. Circumstances change. What one means one day, one may not mean the next. But my opinion of your brother did not change. You are describing something that did not happen. Without listening to Catherine... Isabella continued with her own thoughts. Nobody should rush into an engagement before knowing what they are doing, and young men change their opinions so easily. Why should a brother's happiness be more important to me than my friend's? My advice to you, Catherine, is not to be in a hurry. Tilney says people often deceive themselves about the state of their own heart, and I believe that he is right. Oh, look, here he comes. But he will not see us here. But Captain Tilney walked directly to their bench and took the seat next to Isabella. The two of them began whispering together, making Catherine very uncomfortable and very jealous for her brother. Finally she stood and said, Isabella, I would like to join Mrs. Allen. 
Will you walk with me? You go without me, Isabella said. I must wait here for my sisters. Catherine could do nothing to persuade Isabella to leave the bench, and so she found Mrs. Allen and left the pump room. It seemed to her that Captain Tilney was falling in love with Isabella, and that her friend was unconsciously encouraging him. It had to be an unconscious flirtation, because Isabella was engaged to James. But Catherine was left confused and worried by her conversations with Isabella that day. Why had she talked so much about money? Why had she been so obviously pleased at seeing Captain Tilney? And how did John Thorpe come to the conclusion that she had encouraged him to fall in love with her? A few days passed, and Catherine, although not allowing herself to suspect Isabella of improper behaviour, could not help noticing that her friend seemed an altered creature. When she was with Catherine and James in the Allens' or Thorpe's lodgings, she seemed a bit dreamy, and not quite as full of spirit and energy as before. That alone would not have troubled Catherine, but when she saw Isabella in the public rooms, she had to admit that she became much livelier and flirtatious when Captain Tilney was in the room. Catherine could see that James was confused and hurt by his fiancée's behaviour, and she thought that Captain Tilney, too, was being treated badly by Isabella. Surely Isabella had not told him that she was an engaged woman. Otherwise, he would not have flattered her with so much attention. Catherine worried so much about the situation that she finally decided to speak to Henry Tilney about it, describing what she had observed and ending by saying, I'm certain that your brother must be unaware that Miss Thorpe is engaged to be married to my brother James. My brother does know that, replied Mr Tilney. Does he? asked Catherine. Then why does he pursue Isabella as if she was unattached? He will have his heart broken if he falls in love with her. I am sure that my brother can look after his own heart, Henry said with a smile. I have told him that Miss Thorpe is engaged, but he is his own master and will do as he pleases. But he is giving great pain and anxiety to my brother. Are you sure that this distress is caused by Frederick? Is it his attentions to Miss Thorpe, or Miss Thorpe's reaction to them, that gives pain to your brother? Is it not the same thing? I think your brother would understand the difference. No man is offended by another man's admiration of the woman he loves. It is the woman only who can turn it into a tragedy. Should I warn James? Or can you speak to your brother and advise him to leave Bath? I do not believe that any one of the three people involved in this situation would thank us for our advice. If your brother and Miss Thorpe love each other, as you are certain they do, they will never tease each other beyond what is acceptable to them both. Don't worry. Frederick will not stay long in Bath, and then your brother and his fiancée will laugh about poor Captain Tilney's attachment to the beautiful Isabella. Catherine could not argue against Henry's analysis of the situation, and she decided to stop worrying about it. That evening, Isabella and James were at the Allens' lodgings to say goodbye to Catherine, and with relief she saw only affectionate behaviour between them.